thank you for having this paper on the program. It's it's a great pleasure to be a part of this terrific conference. And uh, as Matthew said, this is joint work with Bernardo and Oli. And uh, in this paper, we are <clears throat> very much motivated by uh, policy discussions, and we want to make academic research useful for uh, central banks. And uh, let me explain in a bit why we think it's it's a useful piece of research. First, we know when we think about monetary policy, uh, a lot of action involves changes in the real interest rate, right? And, and so the conventional policy is kind of very straightforward. You anchor inflation expectations at some number, you know, 2%, 3%, it depends on the country. And then you vary the nominal interest rate. And by changing the nominal rate, you're going to change the real rate. And so that you're going to accelerate or decelerate the economy. So it's kind of very straightforward. Now, obviously, we don't have a lot of capacity to do this because the nominal rate is uh, stuck at zero. But it doesn't mean we, we can't have uh, powers to, to help the economy. And specifically, what we can do is to use unconventional policy tools where this in here is stuck at zero, more or less. But we can still change inflation expectations through forward guidance, through quantitative easing, through policy communication and other tools. And hopefully through that change, we can and hopefully through that change, we can uh, help the economy when uh, other tools are not available. There is clearly uh, a strong appreciation of this idea, not only in academics, but also in, uh, central, in the central banking community. Mario Draghi, uh, when he was describing uh, the workings of quantitative easing, he said, look, you know, we're going to raise inflation expectations. This is going to push the real rates down, and this is going to stimulate firms to invest and stimulate economic activity. Now, so in theory, it's working very nicely, and it's a very powerful policy tool. Uh, but reality, obviously, is more complicated, and um, we have to think about how inflation expectations are responding to policy communication, and in general, you know, what uh, influences the formation of inflation expectations. To give you a sense of, you know, what we know about inflation expectations, um, you know, one thing I can do is to cite Jeremy Rudd's paper, but instead I will give you three quotes from uh, former Fed chairs. Uh, this is from Alan Greenspan, who is saying here that inflation expectations um, are important. Uh, he doesn't know what it is exactly, but it doesn't mean it's not real. So he wants to know more about expected inflation. Some years later, Ben Bernanke gave a major speech again about inflation dynamics, inflation expectations, and he again uh, emphasized that inflation expectations are very important. We know relatively little, they are of great practical importance. And then he went on and said, we know particularly little about um, price expectations of businesses who are after all the price setters in the first instance. And this goes back to Philippe's point that, you know, we want to see the, the, the wage expectations, the wage bargaining, you know, it's another form of price setting, wage saving. Then some years later, again, uh, Janet Yellen is saying, you know, most importantly, we need to know uh, about inflation expectations and how they are formed and how we can use them for policy. Recently, Jay Powell uh, was saying that, you know, inflation expectations are terribly important for him and he is watching them all the time. So I think, you know, this brief review tells you that there is a lot of interest in understanding inflation expectations and using them as a policy tool um, to manage inflation expectations and through that help the economy. Now, we have been very attentive to this, please, from the central bankers to do something about this and help us better understand inflation expectations. And specifically, we're particularly sensitive to this point made by Ben Bernanke that we need to do something about measurement of inflation expectations for price setters, businesses, CEOs. And so what we do in this paper is introduce a new survey of CEOs and uh, try to document some basic properties of inflation expectations for these economic players. So that's our objective. Um, unlike, you know, standard service where we have households or financial market participants, our uh, subjects are going to be uh, C-level employees, so CFO, CEOs, business owners. Usually it's very hard to get um, all the, uh, of those people, um, you know, their time is very precious. Um, access to them is protected by small armies of assistants, um, uh, secretaries, and all sorts of other filters. So it's very hard to talk to those people directly. And uh, as a result, what we did uh, was to 
team up with a very prominent uh, survey firm, which uh, you know talks to the CEOs as a part of other survey exercises that they do, and uh, have uh, a few add-on questions to their existing service. So we kind of piggyback on what these guys are doing and try to have a direct uh, connection to CEO. So bypass all the secretaries, assistants, and so on, and get some um, information directly from uh, chief, chief executives. Now, this is going to be relatively a short survey. We started this only a little over three years ago. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, we had a lot of variation over these three years. So this, this is going to be a very informative survey, despite the very short time series dimension. Um, we have a relatively large cross-section of firms participating in the survey, roughly 300 in every way, um, wave. And, uh, you know, we would like to have more, but as I told you, this, these people are super busy and it's very hard to have very large surveys uh, for those people. And they would be very expensive. Also, what's great about the survey is that it has a very large panel component so that people repeatedly participate in the surveys. And as a result, we can track expectations over time and see how people respond to changes in macroeconomic conditions or in their kind of idiosyncratic firm specific uh, circumstances. So that's useful. We also cover not, you know, standard industries such as manufacturing, but also services. It's a smaller part of the sample, which reflects the kind of history of the survey. But, you know, roughly half of the respondents are going to be from services. And also we have a collection of uh, small, medium and large firms. Okay, and that's very important because we often have very small businesses, sometimes mostly households, self-employed. But we have very large businesses that participate, for example, in the Livingston survey. But we don't have everything in, in the same survey very often. So what I want to tell you here uh, in this slide is that uh, the sample is going to be highly heterogeneous, roughly representative of the uh, U.S. population of firms, um, and it has a number of desirable elements, such as relatively large cross-section and a panel dimension. And as I said, we have a lot of variation. Now, what I will do next is to present you a series of facts and try to connect these facts to how anchored inflation expectations are for the uh, chief executives. And the first, uh, but before I do this, let me briefly describe the, the questions that we have in the survey. We're going to have only two questions in this add-on module. It doesn't sound like a lot, but we managed to squeeze actually five questions into two, and we have been very creative, and we're very grateful to the survey firm that they allowed us to do this. The first question is going to be asked in every wave, and we basically elicit a numeric inflation forecast from the CEOs. And it may seem like a very simple question, but there is a lot of thought that went into this. Um, we wanted to minimize the priming effect, so we have an open-ended question. We ask about this inflation rather than a change in the general level of prices. It's about specific price index. So it may seem very simple, but in, in fact, this is a very good question. Okay. A lot of thought went into this. Now, then we have a second question, and uh, this second question is going to be different across waves, and we're going to have a rotation across waves. In the, in the first version, say, you know, it's April wave, we're going to ask people to tell us about what they think is the inflation target of the Fed. And this is useful just to get a sense of how much people know about monetary policy, objectives of the central bank, you know, how much attention do they pay to uh, to, to monetary policy. The second question is about um, what they uh, think inflation has been. Okay, so we want to look at perceptions. And the reason why it's important is because we know perceptions are extremely strong predictors of future inflation. And it also can tell us something about, uh, you know, why we have disagreement in inflation forecasts and what kind of model we should use when we think about inflation expectations. Next, we ask people about longer run inflation expectations. What will happen over the next five years? Again, this is very important. Um, if we think about if we think about uh, how anchored inflation expectations are, because you know we don't want to just look at um, current business conditions. We also want to look at longer term outlook, and presumably this number should be very close to the two percent inflation target in the U.S. If inflation expectations are anchored. Because whatever happens today probably has very little bearing on what is going to happen with inflation in 2026 or 2027. 
finally, we ask people to give us uh, a probability, uh, a measure of uncertainty that inflation is going to exceed 5% over the next 12 months. And again, this is very useful because it tells us how much confidence people have in their forecasts. Uh, it's also related to how anchored inflation expectations are. For example, if inflation expectations are not particularly anchored, we should see a lot of uncertainty about uh, future inflation. And so what I'll do next, as I said, is go basically over each of these questions and sometimes relate uh, one to another and see what we can learn from that about how anchored inflation expectations are and also some basic properties of inflation expectations for the CEOs. Here is the first fact. This is the time series of average inflation expectations uh, made by the uh, financial markets. This is coming from the Cleveland Fed. Thank you for doing this public service, Cleveland Fed. Um, we have professional forecasters. This is the green line. This is coming from the Philly Fed. Okay. Thank you again, uh, Philly Fed. Uh, Michigan serve consumers. Okay. This is households, the blue line. And then we have firms. This is our survey. Survey of firms inflation expectations, SOFI. And what you should see here is that, you know, historically expectations were more or less the same across um, uh, various economic players when inflation was high. But since sometime in the 90s, we see a divergence. Um, professionals and financial markets think inflation is 2%. Households think it's much higher. And what is interesting is that firms are somewhere in between. You know, when we started the survey, um, managers looked like uh, households, then they started to look more like professional forecasters. And in recent months, this is what I was uh, mentioning in my question to Philippe and Loretta, that we see this great divergence. Professionals and financial markets don't see a lot of inflation on the horizon. Um, uh, managers and households see a lot more inflation. This number here, this is for July 2021. This is the last reading of our survey. So what this tells you is that you can't use households or professionals as a substitute for uh, a survey for CEOs. It seems they have a different behavior. And so it kind of justifies why we want to have a survey of, of uh, price setters because they have different properties. This also goes back to Ben Bernanke's point that we need a survey of price setters. When you look at disagreement, how much in the cross section you have a lot of uh, uh, variation in what you know, people expect inflation to be. This is professionals, very little disagreement, relatively little disagreement. This is households, an order of magnitude disagreement. And, uh, you know, again, firms are somewhere here in between. Again, this underscores that CEOs um, behave differently from professional uh, forecasters in the households. Now, the reason why these two facts are important um, is because if you have anchored inflation expectations, everybody should be more or less the agree in agreement about where inflation is going to be. And you can see something like this for professional forecasters, right? They basically give you small variations around 2% inflation target. These guys have a lot more disagreement. And this is a sign that these people don't have anchored expectations. The managers are somewhere in between. You know, there is less disagreement than households, but still very, very high level. The same is true here. You look at the levels, they are way higher than 2% inflation target. Okay, and so this tells us that their expectations are not necessarily anchored. Now, the next fact I want to uh, present to you is the amount of uncertainty in inflation forecasts. And here we have three agents. This is firms predicting, giving us a probability that inflation is going to be greater than 5%. This is households, this is professional forecasters. Professional forecasters, and this is for a specific day, 2019 first quarter, so nobody knows that we're going to have COVID or anything like this. Professional forecasters basically assign very, very little probability that inflation will exceed 4%. You look at households and firms and you see this massive tail, okay, massive tail. So these people are thinking it's entirely possible to have inflation more than 4% or more than 5%. And again, this is not a sign of anchored inflation expectations. People should not be thinking that this was possible, at least, you know, in this time. It should be super unlikely that we're going to have inflation this high. Now, exposed, it doesn't seem that crazy that these people thought this kind of inflation can happen because we, we see this kind of inflation now. But 
at that time, it was something um, pretty unreasonable to think that inflation may be this high with this high probability. So again, this is a sign of an anchored inflation expectations. Now, we have a lot of disagreement about future, and maybe this is not surprising. People have different interpretations um, of what is happening. And maybe they have different models. But if you believe in full information rational expectations, <clears throat> this is something that Jeremy Rudd was, I think, you know, critical of. Uh, at least people should agree on, on the current conditions so on past inflation, right? So everybody can go to the BLS website and see what inflation has been or what inflation is. Um, you ask managers what inflation is um, now, and uh, uh, this is the actual numbers, this uh, vertical bars. And you see that there is a lot of disagreement about what is happening in the economy. And again, this should not happen in the full information rational expectations. Now, why, why would we see this dispersion? Well, you know, part of this may be an attention to aggregate statistic. If inflation is not very high, you know, you can... Uh, try to get your inferences about inflation from uh, personal shopping uh, experience or from gas prices or from some other salient prices. But in any case, it tells us that there is a lot of disagreement here. And we know this stuff here, these perceptions are going to be very strong predictors of um, inflation expectations. So again, this is telling us that, you know, this anchorness of inflation expectations is, is, is you know, to some extent is there. These people don't predict or perceive um, uh, astronomical inflation rates, but um, it's not as anchored as, I guess, one would like it to be. Another thing you can do is to look uh, how people revise their inflation expectations, right? So we have, as I said, incoming macro, macroeconomic data or microeconomic data. And if you have anchored inflation expectations, your expectations should not be sensitive. Um, to the shocks. You shouldn't revise this numbers much when you go from one quarter to another. You, you, you should expect inflation to be 2% more or less next year all the time. And something like this is true for professional forecasters. The size of revisions at the short end, um, this is uh, field bars or loan end, longer run inflation expectations, empty bars, is very small. You know, the standard deviation of these revisions is very small. You look at households, and again, this is an order of magnitude bigger in terms of revisions. It's not unusual to see people revising their inflation expectations by 5% up or 5% down in the short end and at the longer end. Uh, for managers, um, again, somewhere in between, again, this tells us that we need to have a separate uh, survey of firms, very big revisions, um, somewhere between households and professional forecasters. And again, it tells us something about that you know, these expectations are not particularly anchored. People are revising these numbers by big magnitudes, and that's inconsistent with anchored inflation expectations. Now, we can move this a little further and say, you know, what is the connection between the revisions in short-run inflation expectations and long-run inflation expectations? And uh, if you really have anchored inflation expectations, then what you should see is that whatever happens today in terms of revisions for short-term inflation expectations should be basically and correlated with what you think inflation uh, revisions, expectations, uh, revisions for expected inflation at longer horizons. Because as I said, you know, what happens now with inflation is not going to tell us much about inflation in 2026 or 2020 uh, or 2030. We can do this uh, formally um, by basically running a regression where we have one year ahead inflation forecasts, revisions for them on the horizontal axis. This is five year ahead revisions, and this is a bin scatter plot. So kind of you reduce a lot of noise uh, in the data by using the bin scatter. But what this bin scatter shows to you is that there is a very strong, very clear positive relationship. The R square is very high, 0.6. Um, the slope is very high, close to one. And so this tells us that households uh, and for, it's, it's also true for households, that households and firms think inflation is much more persistent than we actually have in the data. We have a lot of mean reversion in inflation. And uh, you also see a lot of mean reversion in the forecasts uh, of, uh, in the projections of professional forecasters. And so here we have this, you know, remarkable persistence, a lot of correlation. Um, 
And, uh, you know, again, this is not a sign of anchored inflation expectations. Now, finally, we asked people, remember, a question about uh, the perceived inflation target of the Fed. Uh, remember, this is CEOs. This, this people set prices, or at least according to our models, they set prices. And so they should be very sensitive to monetary policy in general. Again, if you believe in full information rational expectations, we ask those people to tell us what is the inflation target of the Fed. 30% basically said, I don't know. Um, another 20 basically gave us a response which we can't use. Uh, it's not interpretable. And only 20, 25% of people gave us a number which is close to 2%. Now, this may be a sign of success. Remember, Keynes once said that he wants to make uh, economic policy as boring as dentistry. And, you know, maybe we're at that stage. Inflation has been low and stable for such a long time that, you know, most people don't care if inflation is 2.1% or 1.9% or 2%. But it is important if you use uh, management of inflation expectations to try to convince those people that, look, inflation is going to be higher above average for a little bit, but that it will be back to normal or now inflation is, um, you know, doing something. But, you know, we convince you that this is going to be okay in the longer run. Um, this is going to be more challenging because if you see something like this, then it means that you have to penetrate through the wall of inattention on the part of managers. Uh, and this may be a problem for policy uh, in this dimension. So we have these dimensions of anchoredness um, from surveys, and none of them seems to be satisfied, at least in the US. Okay. Where does this leave us? Um, well, for me, uh, I guess for us, for all of us, for all of us on this paper, uh, management of expectations is a very powerful tool, at least in theory. Maybe not as powerful as predicted by full information rational expectations models, but it can still be very, very powerful. It also tells us that, you know, if we want to manage expectations, and specifically price setters, we have to have a way to measure their expectations, because you can't have management without measurement. Um, it also tells us that there are massive departures from fire. Um, so, you know, some of the criticism from Jeremy is probably, Jeremy Rudd is probably valid, but it's not as hopeless as, as, as he suggests. I think we still have a lot of potential there. And, you know, maybe it's a sign of success rather than a sign of, you know, some deep trouble in our models. We just need to think um, in terms of different models where expectations can have a separate life. And finally, we obviously need to invest uh, more resources uh, into building uh, infrastructure for measurement and management of uh, inflation expectations. Um, this is why, you know, this kind of survey should be run by a statistical agency or by a central bank rather than academics. Uh, but for us, it's very clear for academics that we should really focus on building frameworks, theoretical frameworks that can explicitly uh, model information rigidities in attention and so on that can rationalize the facts that we see in the data and hopefully inform policy about the optimal course of action. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thanks, Yuri. Um, very interesting. So remember that you can leave your question in the chat room or at the end, like we can also like put your name and your affiliation and we can have a discussion, a discussion at the end. So now, um, Michael, where, um, I don't know if you can share your screen. So Not can... yet, actually. Can you know? Yes. Du -du -du. Fantastic. Great. So you have again between 20 and, 20 and 22 minutes, so let's take it. Okay, perfect. Well, thanks a lot for including our paper in the program. It's joint work with Francesco da Junto at Boston College, Daniel Huang in Karlsruhe and Marita Palovita at the Bank of Finland. I think actually I should have maybe compared notes with Yuri beforehand, because like, first of all, I have also three quotes here, at least I have different ones, but then the motivation is very similar. So I'm gonna start out with a quote by Karl Brunner, who at some point actually made a point that, you know, uh, central banking is kind of uh, esoteric, uh, which is just reflected in the fact that, you know, whatever you hear is kind of in intelligible uh, words and hard to make sense of which then a couple of years later, Adam Greenspan kind of confirmed in the sense that saying that, you know, if you thought you understood what I was trying to convey, clearly you misunderstood me. And now if you move forward like two decades or so, you start to see that and this is just, uh, I guess, representative of the broader uh, view of many, many central banks that, 
you know, now actually on the one hand, central banks explicitly try to manage expectations of households and firms, but crucially also like they make an active effort of trying to be understood by ordinary people who central banks ultimately serve, as Christine Lagarde said in 2019. And so, oh, here we are. And so the reason why actually we want to understand and study like, how central banks can potentially manage subjective expectations, because at the end of the day, as uh, Yuri was also alluding to, you know, subjective expectations are potentially a very powerful tool to actually uh, uh, steer aggregate demand. So like, for example, through a subjective uh, uh, Fisher equation, I feel so like if you are able to move around uh, perceived real interest rates, it has the power to infect, and we'll see that in micro data, I think that's the Key, key innovation that is not in Jeremy Watt's paper, if you look at the uh, bibliography, I think the only paper that was cited in the last 10 years was some of his own work. There's now a host of micro evidence um, in which we do see that firms and households actually do adjust their consumption savings, investment, and wage setting and price setting decisions to inflation expectations. So I think we will now have uh, very powerful evidence. And so like, as I think uh, Yuri Oli and co-authors at some point also highlighted in some previous work, especially in times when policy rates are low and you can, as a central bank, not move around normal interest rates, still you could potentially steer aggregate demand through the management of subjective inflation expectations. And so what we understand in this paper is like, if you look at ordinary households, how can potentially central banks reach out and manage the expectations of households? You know, oftentimes the conventional policy narrative is, you know, inflation expectations are well anchored. Uh, households then actually make decisions on the, when uh, nominal rates are moved around, which then translates into a moving uh, real interest rate. And uh, yet in some previous work, we've actually shown that you know, this narrative doesn't seem to really work out for the overall population. So here we just actually plot the policy rate by the ECB over time. And then we want to understand through surveys, how do actually households adjust their propensity to take out debt to movements and in interest rates. And we do that for Finland, where we observe at the individual level measures of cognitive abilities. We just simply split the sample in two. And we show that, you know, if you look at the top part of the distribution by IQ, they behave pretty much as we, uh, the policy narrative would say, policy rates go down, propensity to take out debt go up, policy rates flat, propensity flat, and vice versa, and rates actually uh, go up again. Instead, if we look at the bottom part, so the bottom 50% of the Finnish population for whom we observe IQ, they barely react at all. So like this first conventional narrative blocked off. Then let's actually look at the second one, like, you know, maybe a, a name of communication instead of directly uh, managing expectations is directly just to focus on whether we can actually anchor the expectations of households. For firms, we already saw it, doesn't seem actually that expectations are well anchored. For households, similarly, we see this unconditionally large upward bias. Loretta alluded to large heterogeneity also in this upward bias in the cross section, and just also very little knowledge of basic pillars of policy making. So here, what I'm plotting is, uh, uh, which actually came out, I think, the first time really about 20 years ago from a Cleveland Fed discussion paper that there is a cross survey samples and countries, this unconditional upward bias uh, of uh, women relative to men. So everyone is biased upwards. However, women even have higher average inflation expectations. What we put to the table here is to show that actually this upward bias is actually also true within households rather than across households. Yeah, so with men and women within the same household. And what you however also see, if you then just do a simple split of all households into two parts, those in which the male household had declares of not doing uh, grocery shopping at all, this panel here, versus actually households in which a man and woman uh, share the shopping, you see that this gender difference increases by 50% in households where you've like traditional gender norms versus like, in households in which everyone at least partially participates in grocery shopping and therefore exposed to the volatile price changes in daily shopping, you see that the gender bias disappears and it disappears because also like men have now even larger upward bias in inflation expectations. So like as Loretta was saying, exposure to frequent salient price changes is actually indeed a potential determinant for this upward bias in inflation expectations. This is not just from some work with Oli and Yuri, like, you know, also that people have very little knowledge about basic pillars of policymaking, 
we ran the Federal Bureau households, 20,000 households from the US. What do you think is the average inflation rate the Federal Reserve tries to achieve over longer periods of time? And you see that actually uh, it's about, you know, almost 40% of households of 20,000 representative US American households that think actually the inflation target is higher than uh, 10%. So it looks like, you know, this idea that uh, the expectations are well anchored doesn't pan out in the data. So as you was saying, well, it could be a sign of success. Inflation has been so low and stable, so households don't really have actually strong incentives to gather and acquire information about inflation potentially. But of course, this is not an innocuous interpretation of the data, because if that's the case, then of course, communication has a really hard battle to fight to actually pierce the veil of ignorance and trying to actually get through the attention of households. And so that's pretty much the backdrop against which we actually want to understand which type of communication potentially is effective in moving expectations. And to do so, we went out in the spring of last year to decide together with Statistics Finland, a large scale survey, uh, which we fielded on the population of Finnish men in, uh, uh, in the spring of last year. And the crucial part was that for those men, not only do we observe like survey answers, but crucially also measures of IQ from the military, but also like uh, all type of registry type data. And then what we did, we went out that we and randomized different pieces of information that we provided through what we call like this, you know, randomized controlled trial approach to those households that participate. And specifically, we want to look at messages that uh, kind of imitated what uh, the theoretical literature is called like target versus instrument uh, communication. So target communication, you know, you just say, uh, what is the aim you want to achieve with a certain policy? And I'll come back to which uh, message we use in a second versus an instrument communication just tells us exactly what is now actually the instrument the central bank is using to actually reach the specified target. And we want to understand whether one or the other is potentially better able of moving expectations. And just to give you some, you know, overview of the results, you know, and this is just a very simple way of seeing how households perceive those uh, communication tools in a way that you don't really have to specify, you know, numerical answers, or you don't really have to think too hard about uh, scenarios and future outcomes. You just simply ask, you know, those two types of communications, to which extent do you think actually they will benefit households in Finland? Seven means they will benefit a lot. One means they will benefit a little. And so here you just see the full distribution for those uh, men in Finland that receive the target communication versus the instrument communication. And here you see that the full distribution is shifted to the right for target communication, indicating that it's, it's perceived, at least by our sample of Finnish men, as being more beneficial to talking about the target rather than actually providing needy greedy details of the instruments by which you want to achieve these targets. Now, let me tell you a little bit about the exact uh, survey we uh, uh, we designed and the questions we we asked. So, like as I mentioned, we did that in the spring of last year. Um, I understand. So I always see messages popping up, but I think it's just from some chat uh, between Peter and Yori. Sorry for being uh, uh, distracted. And so, like um, it's a sample of all men in Finland for whom we observe IQ data. And then, though, given that we cannot really directly use IQ for stratification, but only uh, merge it in afterwards, we actually just stratified. For all men that have a certain age range for, uh, for which we have the IQ data, but also like then by education, because there is some uh, correlation between IQ and education. And then we fielded it in uh, June of last year. And the overall survey had three big parts. So the first part, you know, we first elicited some basic demographics, financial constraints, financial portfolios, the actual income in uh, 2019. Then we elicited prior income expectations or expectations on the expected change in monthly gross income in 2020. Then the second part was the experimental stage that I'll detail in the next slides. And then subsequently, you know, we uh, have the same questions for everyone again, elicit again, income change expectations, but this time in a slightly different wording to just make sure that people actually uh, don't get uh, survey fatigue and still actually answer truthfully. And then we also have like, you know, financial literacy questions, shopping duties and things like that. Now, what we did in the information provision experiment part of the survey, we wanted to get an idea whether this notion of target versus instrument communication 
indeed might differentially pan out in moving expectations. And so the way we did that was trying to imitate an ideal uh, setup from the laboratory in which we keep constant the sender of the message, Oli Ren in our case, in which we kept constant the medium which via which this message was communicated, which was Twitter in our case. And then of course, you know, given that we are in the midst of a crisis period, we also wanted to make sure that the control group that doesn't get any relevant information about uh, monetary policy, but also had like a tweet from a crisis period and the same type of amount of text to read, just to make sure that everyone has like a similar cognitive burden of going through the survey. So now this is the official tweet uh, that we actually got from Oli Rehn's Twitter account, the president of the Bank of Finland. So here we didn't show actually this uh, text here or like the, the picture. Instead, we just directly provided the Finnish version uh, of this uh, one sentence in the, in the survey. And so the English translation reads that the European Central Bank will do whatever is necessary to minimize the financial damage to citizens caused by the corona crisis. You know, it's... Uh, there are no specific numbers, uh, no uh, instrument, no jargon, just literally what the aim of the policy is. And in the words of uh, Angeletos, when he discussed Oli and Yuri at Jackson Hole last year, you know, it's a simple, crisp, and constructively imprecise message. And as I said, like, you know, this last sentence was not part of the survey. The second treatment then was the instrument communication, where we just provided the truthful fact that, you know, which kind of came from Oli Rehn's Twitter account, the new 750 billion pandemic emergency program was launched by the European Central Bank. So no uh, reason why it's implemented. And as Loretta said, well, this potentially is really crucial explaining to households and firms why you do certain policies, only like the actual policy instrument, no target, a large amount, which likely is considered large for both experts and, uh, and uh, non-experts. And again, we didn't have the last sentence. And then, you know, the control group also received a tweet about a period of crisis in Finland. However, no direct mention to any uh, monetary policy action. And, you know, this within individual uh, posterior relative to prior design relative to control group allows us to purge any potential crisis divide. Then a crucial ingredient, of course, for us is merging in IQ data. This is uh, similar to what we've done in previous work. We get from the military a co aggregate measure that is the outcome of about 120 questions, which people in Finland take around the age of 19. And then you can think of it like the measure of IQ following a discretized normal distribution between one and nine. Nine is the top 9% within the cohort. One is the bottom 4% within cohort uh, in terms of uh, cognitive abilities. As I said, you know, nice part of having a Nordic country, you can merge in pretty much whatever you can imagine. And so like in terms of now the sample, we have about 2,600 survey participants that we can match to all the other type of data. We actually drop about 140 participants because there was a discrepancy between our survey elicited annual income and actual registry income, most likely because people mixed up annual and monthly income of more than $100,000. And then it was equally split roughly across target and instrument uh, communication arms and the control group. And based on observables, it was all well balanced. In terms of now average monthly income with about 5,000 uh, euros, uh, people on average expected a drop in monthly income in 2020, about 90 euros. People were on average uh, 40 percent, uh, 40 years old, uh, a little bit less than 50% are college educated. You know, of course, if everyone knew already that you know the PEPP was launched and uh, the ECB would do whatever it takes, we wouldn't expect any treatment effects. But you see, you know, we listed it directly. To which extent were you aware of these policy measures? That only about a quarter of our survey participants had actually heard of these policies. So economically, what are we doing? We just look at the change in individuals expected change in monthly income in 2020 after our policy treatment relative to before on treatment indicators and a host of uh, observables, you know, age, age squared, marital status, income, and all those type of things, which are listed here below. Now let's just look, simply let's look at the data. So let's you know compare the effect on uh, changes in income exchange expectations for target communication versus instrument communication, raw data in one and three, conditional observables in two and four. And so what you see is like 
you know, remember on average, people expected a drop in monthly income of about 90 euros. We pretty much completely offset this drop in income ex change expectations prior to the intervention. If you hear Oli Rehn telling us that the ECB does whatever it takes, instead, actually, for the instrument communication, you know, the point estimate is uh, smaller by about uh, half, and also it's not statistically significant. Of course, you know, there could be, and this is uh, the main reason why we did in Finland, lots of heterogeneity by the degree of uh, cognitive abilities. We know from some prior work that on average, low IQ men in Finland have more pessimistic uh, expectations. They have a lower level of informedness and tend to actually, on average, uh, react less to uh, policy interventions like cash for clan cuts programs. And so now let's actually see whether the reaction differs by IQ. So here we just now focus on target on communication. ECB does whatever it takes, men are below the median IQ and men above the median IQ. And you see that it is especially men with the lower cognitive abilities now a sample that actually uh, update upwards their posterior income expectations between 100 and 160 uh, euros once they hear this target communication. Instead, actually above median IQ men in Finland uh, don't react statistically. So like especially those that typically if most pessimistic expectations and are hard to reach and barely react uh, to policy intervention, that actually simple, crisp uh, communication about targets seems to be actually most responsive to. Now, we already talked a bit briefly about the fact that, you know, maybe you know, there was a differential awareness to the two policies. You know, the PPP is a really big number. Maybe it was heavily covered in the media. Everyone knew about it, and that's actually why we don't see any average effect. Let's actually see, let's only focus on those survey participants that were stated within the survey after the intervention that they were not aware of it. And you see that, you know, if you look at the half of the sample that were unaware of the policy, target communication, strong, significant reaction of 100 uh, euros monthly income updating upwards for target communication, again, no reaction to instrument communication. And it's again, even, you know, unaware below median IQ survey participants that strongly react to target communication, don't react at all to instrument communication. And so the last thing before wrapping up on time, I hope, is that we, you know, want to also split based on prior expectations. You know, oftentimes, you know, if uh, you look at the times of crisis and you want to actually raise the overall level of optimism in the economy, try to actually steer the outlook of those that have the most negative priors. And so on the one hand, we might actually want to see whether indeed there's scope of uh, indeed reaching out to those with actually the most uh, negative priors. And then, you know, if on the flip side, we of course also don't want to make, uh, want to make sure that we don't put off those that actually ex ante at the most uh, positive priors. And so here, what I show is that if you look at those uh, low, below median IQ men with ex ante, priors below the media, and you see they strongly revise upwards the expectations instead of those with the below uh, median income priors. Actually, they slightly realize downward, but it's not statistically significant, and you know, it's unlikely power issue because the samples are roughly equal size. So now, let me wrap up. So like, we do know, at least in theory, that uh, you know forward guidance or communication with households and firms can have pretty large effects. We now actually show in the paper that uh, indeed conditional on being successful in reaching out is of course a big, uh, big condition. You know, there is a type of communication that is really crucial and uh, successful in, in reaching households and moving the expectations, which is this uh, communication about uh, targets and aims of policies, you know, simple crisp and just constructively emphasized communication and especially successful in reaching those that potentially are least uh, sophisticated, unconditionally hard to reach, and unaware men, and of course now, you know, to, uh, to reach actually the potential of communication, I think we still actually have to find, you know, what are the channels actually through which central banks should communicate to reach ordinary households, and I think more generally, like, you know, better understanding the styles and results to use actually to communicate with households. Thanks a lot, uh, uh, Michael. So now I'm going to turn to Hassan. Firstly, let me, you know, Hassan, can, can, can you share the screen? Uh, yes. Perfect. Uh, 
So here, and again, um, you have between like 20, around 20 minutes for your presentation. And then after this, we're gonna have the Q&A. Perfect. Can you confirm that you can see my slides? And I can see your slides and I can see you. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much for putting the paper on the program and for inviting us. This is such a great opportunity for us. Uh, today, I will be talking about selection and information acquisition and monitoring and neutrality, which is joint work with Chung Ryu Yang. Chung Ryu is in the audience, so hopefully he'll take questions in the chat. Um, so the motivation for this project needs no motivating to this audience. Um, we know from even from the talks from today that there's uh, a lot of uncertainty among firms about econo uh, economic outcomes. The average firm in the survey data is highly uncertain uh, about their own prices and uh, their own future prices and as well as, well as about uh, aggregate inflation. Today, I want to focus though on the heterogeneity that we observe among firms about um, their expectations on different outcomes. In particular, one of the things that I'll show you and uh, you should have seen from Yuri's graph a few minutes ago is that there is a high degree of heterogeneity and subjective uncertainty. And I will uh, dig, dig in deeper exactly what I mean by subjective uncertainty in a little bit. But taking this heterogeneity across firms about the economic outcomes, a natural question that follows is that whose expectations matter for macroeconomic outcomes? Um, in particular, if some firms are really informed and some firms are not, um, then should we think about the average firm as the average firm's expectations as the object that matters for our models, or should we think about some kind of selection um, uh, in a particular way? What I'm going to do today is to show you that uh, the precision of firms' expectations, in particular measured by this subjective uncertainty, it's going to be positively correlated with time since last price change for firms, indicating that there is indeed some type of selection in the formation of expectations and information acquisition. To understand how this selection uh, translates into uh, uh, aggregate outcomes, then we need a model. So we're going to write a model with a state-dependent information acquisition that's going to be a combination of rational attention with nominal rigidities to first explain the selection, to kind of get a prediction out of the model that is consistent with what we see in the data. And then we're going to use the model as a vehicle to drive the implications for aggregate outcomes. In particular, in this paper, we're going to focus on monitoring and neutrality and the response of output to monetary shocks. And we're going to show in a sufficient statistic framework that only the most informed firm's expectations are going to matter for output response in the model that we're going to write indicating that indeed we need to take the selection into account and the fact that the average firm is really uncertain about aggregate outcomes might not necessarily uh, imply as worst outcomes as, as we would have imagined. So what do we mean by uh, subjective uncertainty? Um, I'm going to take some data off the shelf from Ali and Yuri's survey in New Zealand. Um, in that survey, one of the questions that um, they have asked firms um, is about firms' own prices. In particular, there's a question that asks, if this firm was able to freely change their prices at this moment, by how much would they change their price? And instead of asking for a point estimate, firms are asked to deliver a distribution over that object. So the object that is being asked at of firms in this question is something that in the menu cost models we would call the price gap. And here firms are reporting their belief distribution over their price gap. So not only we know how far they think they are from their optimal price, but we also see the distribution and the percentage probabilities that they put on different price gaps over the horizon. We can take those distributions and we can calculate the uncertainty of every firm about their own price gap. This should say something about information acquisition. As a firm, I can go out and acquire information and be very certain about what my price should be, or I can delay that decision for when the time comes that I think is the right time to change my price. This figure here is showing a distribution of that object across firms. 
And what I want you to take away from this is that there is a tremendous amount of heterogeneity on how uncertain firms are about what their prices should be. Um, there's uh, almost no mass of firms that are absolutely certain about what their prices should be. There is a, uh, the largest mass happens around 1% uh, standard deviation, which is like the standard deviation of inflation in New Zealand, just in case if you wanna uh, use it as a reference. And then this distribution has a fat tail that goes up uh, to very large values, to two, three standard deviations away, even four standard deviations away. There's a positive mass there. So that's an unconditional moment. I just want you to, to keep this uh, picture in mind, which is very robust to also looking at uh, across industries. So not only we show in black the distribution for all firms, but we have done it for within industry. And we want to convey the message that this doesn't really uh, come from a particular industry. It's an economy-wide object. So that was an unconditional object. We can also look at the conditional object. We can ask conditional and changing the price, how uncertain a firm is about their um, future prices. There's a question in the survey that asks about the last time a firm has changed their price. Um, so I'm going to take that dummy question for a second, and I'm going to say, among the firms that have changed their prices recently, relative to the firms that haven't changed their prices recently, recently being measured by the last 12 months, how does subjective uncertainty differ? And what I want to take away from this is that firms that have changed their prices more recently tend to be more certain about what their prices should be, even if they could change it now as well. Um, this is a very robust pattern uh, that happens uh, with industry fixed effects or even controlling for the perceived frequency of price changes at the firm level. Um, but it's coming from this dummy variable. One other thing that we can do is to, instead of um, uh, regressing it on this dummy, we can actually regress the subjective uncertainty of firms on time elapsed since their last price change, which is a more uh, continuous measure of how long it's been since their price changes. And again, firms that are farther away from their last price change tend to be more uncertain about economic outcomes and their own prices. With that, this is almost a significant at 2% uh, at, at two standard deviation um, level. It's, it barely fails. Uh, to be a two star. Um, but I also want to draw your attention that this is a very small sample because we need this very rich data about firms' expectations and their beliefs about their own price gaps, which ensures us that we're not picking up just noise. Um, so that's my motivation. I'm going to take those uh, uh, two observations and I'm going to try a model, try to write a model that makes sense of that. The model needs to have at least two ingredients, and we're going to put only these two ingredients. We want to understand how expectations are formed, so information acquisition has to be endogenous. That's going to be the rational attention component. The other component that's really important is that we don't see firms changing their prices all the time in the survey, and actually our measure of how certain firms are was correlated with the time since last price change, so we're going to add some type of nominal rigidity, which we're going to start with just Calvo, which is the simplest way of doing that. So the environment is going to be as follows. We're going to take a continuous time environment. There's going to be a measure of price setting firms that are going to be indexed by this I uh, sub index. And firms I's instantaneous profit is just going to be a quadratic function. And it's going to be decreasing in the distance of the firm's price from an ideal price. That's going to be an exogenous process for the firm. Um, and in, in particular, it's just going to be a Brownian motion. Um, this is uh, an assumption that shows up in analytical models of monetary non neutrality, and it can be thought of as a second order approximation to a more micro founded um, profit function, where B just captures the curvature of the profit function around the optimal price of the firm. Given this profit function and this environment, price change opportunities are going to arrive at Poisson rate theta, which is just a Calvo assumption. It's completely endogenous to the firm. They just get a, a Poisson draw once in a while, and they change their prices when they get that. 
Now that was the nominal rigidity part. On the information acquisition part, we're gonna assume that firms do not observe their ideal prices uh, directly, but they can design a signal process that informs them about that price. So the story behind this is that I don't know what my optimal price should be, but I can hire a bunch of uh, uh, researchers that can tell me what my price should be, or I can spend time myself and try to figure out what that price should be, but it's not something that I can do for free. I am not informed about it uh, without doing any, without exerting any type of effort. So the way that we're going to model this process is that I can receive signals of what this ideal price is at any point in time, but I get to decide what the precision of that signal is going to be, which is the sigma SIT. The sigma SIT is basically the noise in the signal that I'm receiving. I can reduce that noise, but reducing that noise is going to be costly, which is the information acquisition cost. So now, given these signals at any point in time, I have a history of these observations. They form my information set. It's going to be this set big SIT. It's the sequence of all the signals that I've seen since the beginning of time. And um, over time, I'm going to choose these precisions or the variances of the noise. How are we going to measure the cost of information acquisition? Following the rational attention literature, just going to assume that this cost is going to be increasing and potentially convex in the mutual information uh, that the firm increases over time. So like the firm acquires information, information is measured by mutual information, um, and that's going to give me a measure of how much information a firm acquires at an instant. The cost is just going to be a convex in that instance information acquisition. That's what this DI implies. What's the problem? So the firm is just going to minimize their lifetime losses. There are two types of losses. The first loss is that if I choose a price that's away from my optimal price, that's going to uh, uh, create losses and profits for me. The second type of cost is just going to be the cost of information acquisition. The story is that information acquisition allows me to have a better estimate of this. And uh, a better estimate reduces these losses, but I also don't want to be too precise because the cost of information can be large. So what is the firm choosing? They're going to choose these precisions or the variances of the noise that I mentioned. But there's also the Calvo uh, friction. I don't get to reset my price all the time, but I, have to, I get to have planned prices, which we're going to call P tilde. Every instant, I'm going to have a planned price. If the Calvo shock arrives, that planned price is going to be my actual price. That's this equation here, that at the, when a Poisson shock arrives, my price resets to this planned price, and then the planned price is going to be chosen according to my information set at a given time, which is going to evolve based on my choice for information acquisition. Today, I'm going to consider two types of convexities for this cost, which is going to be very important for the results that we're going to derive. The first is just going to be no convexity at all, in the sense that the cost of information is just going to be proportional to mutual information. The other one is an extremely convex function, which means that um, information acquisition is free at a, until a constant rate, lambda bar, and anything beyond lambda bar is just going to be extremely expensive. So I get to acquire information at a constant rate rather than deciding how much information I want to acquire at any time. I'm casting this in terms of convexity, because there's going to be a very nice interpretation for how much firms want to smooth their information acquisition over time. Now, before going into the results of the model, I want to briefly uh, mention that how this model is going to be mapped to the data that I showed you in the beginning. So there's going to be the object of a true price gap. The true price gap is how much the firm's price is actually in reality away from their ideal price. This is something that is neither observable to us as econometricians, nor something that is observable to the firm under the assumption of rational attention. This is what firms are trying to learn. But we can decompose that into two components. One is going to be the perceived price gap. This is something that um, we, uh, we can 
ask the firm about. But in the survey, when we ask how much do you think you are away from your ideal price, the firm is just giving us the expectation of this object given their information set. And we can also think about the variance of this object, which is from the perspective of the firm, how uncertain are they about their estimate? And this is what those subjective uncertainties were that we were calculating in the data. So I observed this as the mean of the distributions that firms uh, report, and I observed this as the variance of the distributions that the firms report. Um, and that's how we can map this model to the data, even though we don't observe what the true price gap is. So uh, in terms of the results, I showed you two different uh, information acquisition technologies, one linear, one convex. And I'm going to tell you how information acquisition looks like under each of them. So under the linear cost, there's going to be no smoothing in information acquisition. Firms have no control over their price changes, which means that in between um, price changes, um, firms are not going to pay any attention to what their prices should be. The linear cost implies that I can always postpone information acquisition to the moment that I like and pay no penalty for doing a lumpy information acquisition, uh, uh, for, for adopting a lumpy information acquisition technology. So firms are not going to change their, uh, acquire any information in between price changes, but when the opportunity of a price change arrives, they're always going to acquire enough information to reset their uncertainty to a baseline level Z star, which is going to be characterized implicitly by this equation. Now, this equation doesn't need to make any sense to you uh, on this slide, but the goal is to show you that this Z star, this optimal reset uncertainty, depends on the curvature of the profit function, on the cost of information, and on the frequency of price changes, as we would expect uh, uh, from the incentives of these firms. So that's the strategy for information acquisition um, under linear cost of information. But this doesn't have to be the model. We can also think about a model where firms do a lot of um, uh, precautionary information acquisition, and that's the case when the cost of information acquisition is extremely convex. In that case, firms are always going to acquire information at a constant rate independent of whether this is the time for a price change or not, because they want to be prepared for the time, for when the time comes and lumpy information acquisition is extremely costly. So they do it at a constant rate. So what are the predictions um, for the graphs that I showed you under the two models? Uh, we can derive the time invariant distribution of uncertainty across firms in the model and see which one looks like the data that we started with. So with the convex cost, the distribution of uncertainty is just going to be a univariate degenerate distribution because everyone is acquiring information at a constant rate. Everyone will have the same uh, uncertainty about, the, about their prices. However, with the linear cost, firms that don't change their prices for a while, they also don't acquire any information. So uncertainty is going to be linearly uh, related to time since last price change, which is the regression that I was showing you in the third slide. The implication of that is going to be that uncertainty inherits the exponential distribution between price changes, the time between price changes. And it itself has an expo a shifted exponential uh, distribution like this. There are a lot of firms that, uh, uh, for low levels of uncertainty, there are no firms, but at, a, at an interim level, there's a mass, and then there's a long tail that follows from that, which is very similar to the second slide that I was showing you. So the data seems to be very close to this idea of lumpy information acquisition in the sense that firms don't acquire information until they need it. And when they do, they acquire enough information to go back to the baseline uncertainty. So now that we know which model fits the data better, uh, what are the implications for macroeconomic outcomes? We're going to do this in the case of uh, implications for monetary non-neutrality. So I'm going to follow uh, the Alvarez-Lipi-Lepihan approach of 
deriving a sufficient statistic for monitoring our neutrality. The idea is that we can take a firm and at time zero, we can look at their expected contribution to the impulse response of output. Um, uh, given that we have moved their initial output by uh, a shock of size delta. So this is like something like we shock the ideal prices of the firms, and that's what a monetary policy shock is. And then we look at the expected contribution of a firm to the impulse response of output over their lifetime. There are two state variables to take into account for firms. Uh, their initial gap, so firms can be very far away from their ideal prices in the beginning when the shock happens. Uh, that has to have an impact on the impulse response of output. Uh, there's also the uncertainty of the firm, which here is going to be endogenously determined by the information acquisition strategy of the firm. And that's also a potential variable for this. For every firm with a particular gap and a particular uncertainty, I can calculate their expected contribution to the response of output. And then I can take all of these and integrate it with respect to the stationary distribution of uh, price gaps and uncertainty in, in the equilibrium. And that should give me the aggregate, the area under the aggregate impulse response of output uh, to a monetary policy shock um, uh, of size delta. Now, what does this object look like? For a shock of size one, let's normalize the size of the shock to one. This is going to be a sum of two components. The first component is going to be, what we know about these models is going to be related to the frequency of price changes. So this is like the famous kurtosis over six times the frequency of price changes sufficient statistic, which in a very simple Calvo model that we have, this component just boils down to being one over theta because the kurtosis of a Laplace distribution is just six, cancels with the six in the bottom, goes away, and we're just left with one over theta, which is the one over the frequency of price changes. What is new here is there's an extra term that comes from the fact that uh, whenever these firms get to change their prices, they don't reset their prices, uh, their, their gaps to zero, because they're, um, there's uncertainty on their part about what their prices should be. So in the uh, language of these models, this is a model with random reinjection. Whenever the firm gets to change their prices, they go back to a place where their contribution is not going to be zero going forward, but it's going to be something smaller. That should depend on how uncertain firms are and how close firms get to their optimal prices when they get to reset their prices. So it should intuitively have something to do with subjective uncertainty. If it's zero, we should be back to, uh, if subjective uncertainty is zero, we should be back to just like the sufficient statistic being one over theta. But in this model, uncertainty is never zero for no one. And there's a lot of heterogeneity in, uh, in uncertainty of firms. So the question is that whose uncertainty shows up in the sufficient statistic? And it turns out that the only uncertainty that shows up here is the uncertainty of the most informed firms in the economy, which is in the exponential distribution that I was showing you, the minimum uncertainty that firms have in that distribution. So even though that there's a long tail of uncertain firms, when we think about the contribution of those firms to the impulse response of output, that long tail does not matter and the firm that shows up in the sufficient statistic is the firm that has the lowest subjective uncertainty. So my main takeaway from um, this. We're almost out of time, sorry. I am almost concluding. Thank you. So um, the main takeaway is that even though that there's a lot of heterogeneity and there are a lot of firms that are uninformed, only the most informed firms matter for monitoring and neutrality. So to conclude, we show suggestive evidence that there's selection and information acquisition we show that this is consistent with the state-dependent information acquisition model, with selection and information acquisition. And we show that as um, a macroeconomic implication, this implies that the only, most, uh, only the most informed firm's expectations matter for the response of output to a monetary policy shock. Thank you very much, and I'll stop uh, there. Thanks.
thanks a lot for um, for for your presentation. That's very interesting. So now let's move to the um, Q and A. And actually, Emmanuel has a a, a question uh, for you in the chat. So say hi, Hassan. You find a positive relationship between uncertainty and the time and time since the last price adjustment. Does that suggest that the firm that faced more volatile shock, volatile shock, which may take them uh, make them more uncertain, reprise less frequency, and so that evidence against implication from many cost model and increasing the volatile shock implies more frequent price adjustment. Um. Okay, so I. I can divide it to two questions because I think uh, I'm sympathetic with one implication, but not sure about the other implication. So um, the positive correlation between uncertainty and time since the last price change, uh, price adjustment, is robust to controlling for um, uh, the frequency of price changes. So one of the things that I didn't show you and one of the controls that we had in that regression is um, there's a question that firms asks, how frequently do you change or review your prices? And there's a lot of heterogeneity in that object. As there is a lot of heterogeneity in uh, the underlying uh, uncertainty, un underlying volatility of the shocks for these firms. But when we control for that uh, frequency, this relationship between time and uncertainty gets even larger. And that is very consistent with this idea of uh, adding this new mechanism that firms don't acquire information in between price changes. But I'm not sure if it's going against the predictions of menu cost models, because that is not a margin that we are modeling. And I think that's a, that's a, that's a margin that has um, its own implication for how frequently firms are changing their prices. Um, we just fix that frequency and we say, okay, conditional on the frequency that firms have, what is the relationship between time since last price change and their subjective uncertainty, which is a different object now because we're not assuming that firms fully know what their prices should be. I hope that answers the question, So, but I'm happy and to discuss it further. And I have a follow-up question on that line. So basically from your regression, we can also think about the opposite relationship. But basically when firms receive information, they tend to to change their prices, and actually, like uh, I think in the US and Serafin find they, they, they find evidence of, for example, when firms have to renegotiate like salaries, for example, they actually like uh, basically have better estimation of inflation expectations. And also, I think that most of the RCDs related with uh, with survey inflation expectations assume that actually actually give them information uh, can 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 change basically the pricing decisions. So. And, and in your model, I guess that basically because of Calvo model uh, of, of, of Calvo pricing that that's not present there. But do you have any thought about how that opposite implication from your regression? Uh, what, what would be the implication for your model? Absolutely, I think you're asked. You're you you put your finger on the most important uh, question. I think, um, which is the idea that I didn't talk anything. I didn't say anything about reverse causality, which is exactly what you're saying. Like in the model, I'm assuming that. Uh, firms have no control over when they change their prices, which eliminates one reason that firms might want to acquire information. Uh, one of the like, firms can go out and hire researchers to say, okay, tell me when is a good time for me to change my price, which is nothing in the, uh, not, nothing captured in the model. So I have uh, two ways of approaching that question. Empirically, it's a really hard question to answer because we would need some kind of an instrument that affects inflation expectations without changing firms' desire to change their prices. Um, even this data was very kind of like detailed and unique in, in the sense that it's asking about distributions. I have run some experiments exactly trying to uh, disentangle this where uh, in an experimental environment, we can, um, give control to agents to decide whether they want to change their prices or make it completely exogenous as in this Calvo model. And um, in that experiment, we do find evidence for this channel. Now, whether the other channel that you're mentioning dampens or amplifies this effect, that's a theoretical question. And we do have, we have started working on a menu cost model where we implement the same mechanism in a menu cost model where there's also benefits for firms uh, information acquisition in terms of when they want to change their prices. It does dampen the results a little bit because now even firms that are not changing their prices acquire information, but that should show itself in the variance 
of the distribution of subjective uncertainty that I showed you. And I, I, when I was presenting, I saw that Yuri was like talking about New Zealand might be a unique case. Uh, I think it's important for us to actually go and look at the distribution of subjective uncertainty. And each of these models will show themselves in a very particular distribution of subjective uncertainty. If all firms are like continuously acquiring information, then I should see a less a lower variance for that distribution, which is not something that we see for New Zealand, but we might see for other countries. Thank you. So Peter has a, a question for Michael, so maybe we can turn to uh, to Michael. So he says, how much do you worry that low IQ, part, IQ participants uh, overestimate the effectiveness of monetary policy during uh, the COVID crisis, and that is why the responder uh, responded more positively to that tar target, annou uh, target announcement? Uh, those that had higher IQ might have understood that this policy will have a small impact on their income in Finland. Uh, what do you think that in case of the other shock where monetary policy is more effective, instrument communication to higher IQ participants might be more effective to target communication uh, in more credible and detail, uh, detailing what exactly is going to be done? So, Michael, maybe you can give us uh, a little yes. bit of uh, yes, about this, and maybe you can also answer like part of the of the of the discussion that has been in the chat. Yeah, so like um, Peter, thanks a lot for the uh, question. That's uh, that's great. So like, you know, now I'm stepping obviously a little bit outside of the did in the paper uh, in the paper because like, you know, I'm I'm not sure how people might react differentially in other uh, economic environments. So, um, like I think the COVID uh, pandemic and the situation last June is nice because it is a time where potentially you know. Uh, you might want to find ways to reach out to people that had very depressed uh, beliefs, where you saw lots of dispersion in beliefs, and in that that situation, like this, uh, uh, talking about uh, targets was very successful, especially in for the parts of the population that typically is not reactive at all. And so we do have like uh, the survey data from the Commission for Finland, where we. Uh, like ran in the past, like those uh, quasi oil like equations of like, do you think it's a good time to purchase larger ticket items uh, on people's inflation expectations? And so typically you see like a uh, pretty precisely estimated zero for the bottom part of the IQ distribution and a strong uh, intertemporal substitution effect for high IQ men in Finland. And it was also still true last year. So like even during uh, the COVID pandemic, you still didn't see any intertemporal substitution at least as the list is for this European Commission survey for the bottom part of the IQ distribution. So like at least, you know, unconditionally during uh, the times of crisis, there was no specific change on like, let's call it the lack of reaction typically observed for, for the bottom IQ distribution, but only that this specific uh, target communication was really effective and whether it's also if we're, whether uh, instrument communication would be more effective in normal times, you know, I'm I can only guess, but I I can see that it might be effective for the uh, the bot uh, the top part of the IQ distribution. I just think that the bottom part is just no idea. Even you know, got talking about specific policy uh, instruments would mean for the actually day to day life, and unless it's actually specified what the implications are, I think will uh, could never be be effective in uh, managing the expectations of the bottom part of the IQ distribution. Thanks, Michael. And I think there is a couple of questions from Hassan, but maybe like there was, before we can uh, ask Yuri that there was a question that uh, was mentioned before about the, uh, how basically um, communication should target households and firms and basically the different style of that. And also like kind of that relates with uh, this uh, question about whether like a, uh, firms are looking at particular prices. Uh, and in particular, for example, like last year, there was a huge kind of change in policy in the case of the US that was the average inflation target. Basically, if, if you saw something uh, around those events and then like what, what you take about how central bank should communicate uh, uh, with household and firm, there should be a different type of, of, of firm as Christian was asking before. Yeah, maybe I should just uh, a, a few thoughts and then I think, uh... Yuri can uh, discuss on uh, the change of policy framework and the evidence there. So, like, you know, in general, uh, we found in some work with Oli and Yuri that, you know, simple, relatable statistics can be very powerful in moving the expectations, but this communication cannot be, let's call it, outsourced to the media, because at least for the case of US consumers, we saw a systematic discounting 
on the side of households for anything that uh, was transmitted through uh, traditional print media. And we asked them why that is the case. And it's just actually the very low level of trust and credibility as a source of information uh, about monetary policy. Instead, maybe somewhat surprisingly, uh, this is how, again, I have to specify, this was evidence uh, for the US that social media had the highest degree of credibility when it comes as a source of information about uh, monetary policy. Now, what does this mean? So, like, you know, think about, you might want to think of him what you want, but about our former president uh, Trump, you know, he had this a personal Twitter account, I used to have it, to which he was actually had a direct line of communication uh, communication to many, many households. Like, you know, I uh, at some point made a statement before, and it was actually, at, I think, in December 2019 at the ECB, in a research seminar with someone from the communications department said, well, we also have this at ECB Twitter account through which we communicate, but you know, people don't follow institutions, people follow people. So like, you know, to the extent that the ECB uh, maybe wants to uh, communicate to ordinary households via Twitter, I think it would have to be uh, President Lagarde, so the, the person uh, in charge of, uh, on top of the institution to actually uh, actively uh, use Twitter. And I guess, you know, that's, I'm not saying she should do it, but at least in our setting, we saw that this kind of could be quite, quite successful. And I guess uh, I'm handing it over now to, to Yuri to talk about his evidence uh, on AIT. A very brief, you know, we'll hear more about AIT tomorrow in the keynote. But, you know, I would uh, like to echo what Loretta said, that communication is a journey. Uh, you are never there, but you can always do better. And as Michael said, you can always <clears throat> uh, use uh, different channels of communication, learn from politicians, hire professional PR firms to make sure that monetary policy communication is reaching out to different parts of the population. I don't think we need to rethink the framework that we have, but we just need to understand the limitations and we shouldn't expect miracles from forward guidance or average inflation target and just given how people form expectations. Of here. Thanks a lot, uh, Michael and Yuri, for, for the question. And, and now we have like some questions from, from Hassan, and maybe you can fully give your answer, your answer as we get out of time. Uh, so, one is from Kiara says, uh, Hi, Hassan, a related question. Uh, how would you think about low and high inflation environment uh, through your model, just via higher frequency or price change? Then um, I think that uh, Javier Duren also has a question. Um, does the model say something about a uh, time varying question since the update is exogenous given Calvo, the state of the economy is independent of incentive to acquire information. Can we extend this? Uh, uh, I think it was answered there. Finally, like uh, Christian also has a question. Uh, what is the role, uh, the role of the firm size and large firm better in acquiring information about the state of the economy? Um, okay, so regarding Kiara's question, I, I think, yes, like, the, so, I'm speculating beyond the model now. I just want to make that clear because like none of this is in the model. But yes, the first place that it would show up is by changing the frequency of price changes. And that is going to higher inflation will make firms uh, change their prices more frequently if that was endogenized in the model, which would shrink the, the, the variance of the distribution of subjective uncertainty. So that's a direct channel that it could affect that. But there's also an indirect channel, which is uh, in, in other work with Chungryo, we have shown that changes in the variance of the shocks in the economy can affect the slope of the Phillips curve and have non-trivial effects on how inflation responds to and output respond to shocks. And we know that level of inflation and volatility of inflation are correlated. Um, when we have higher inflation, uh, it tends to be more volatile. And in the model, if that, that is the case, that having higher inflation also implies higher volatility, it would also affect firms' information acquisition. In particular, it'll make them more attentive to the economy and reduce the effects that expectations have on, on macroeconomic outcomes. Again, these are speculations. I haven't done this, but I expect these channels to emerge if that was endogenized in the model. Uh, for Javier's question, very interesting question. Again, nothing that we have in the in the model um but we could instead of like assuming these shocks are uh, iid across firms think about an aggregate monetary shock and 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 shock the volatility of that which would affect information acquisition beyond what we uh 
what we discussed in the paper. Um, it's an extension that I have tried to work on in the past. It doesn't have like all these nice uh, analytical results flowing out of it. Maybe I'll have a breakthrough. Um, but yeah, definitely, I think it's a very interesting question that follows up. We didn't have aggregate shocks here. We're just MIT shocks. And I think it's very interesting to think about the implications of making firms endogenize the volatility of these shocks and the fact that it can be time varying. And finally, regarding the question about uh, firm size, um, I have I have done some work earlier in a different paper, which was about um, oligopolistic competition and rational intention. And what I learned from that work was that uh, firm size definitely increases firms' incentives. Uh, larger firms have higher incentives to pay attention uh, uh, to monetary shocks or aggregate shocks, but that's not the only effect. So that's one effect that increases attention. There is a counter effect, which is the, the role of pass-through. We know that larger firms also have lower pass-through, so they have lower um, incentive to pay attention to shocks to begin with because they're not gonna utilize that information even if they know what their marginal costs are going to be in the future. With which shock dominates, which force dominates, I think um, uh, needs more work. I know that for example, in New Zealand, larger firms tend to be less attentive, which seems that the second cha theoretical channel might be a work more than the first channel that larger firms have higher incentives to pay attention. Uh, to aggregate shocks. Thanks. And there is a last, last everyone question. <laughs> there is a last question for Michael. Maybe maybe after you can answer. Like Ed has a question. Uh, your treatment takes the form of either or why not treat them with both? Or do you think that they have high uh, uh, effects? I think you're muted. Uh, I'm not sure I uh, uh, caught it uh, uh, completely. So, like, uh, the question was whether we don't actually provide both uh, treatments to households. Like, then we were just a little bit um, restricted by power considerations. And so, like, you know, I'm going, thinking back, if we had a few more people, it would have been indeed like, you know, a nice exercise of having like a fourth group that would have received actually both treatments at the same time to see whether there was um, potentially any interaction effect. And uh, whether it actually would have maybe increased uh, also like providing some context to the, um, uh, the instrument communication would have actually potentially even increased the effectiveness. But yeah, unfortunately, I can't, uh, we can't go back in time to change. But I definitely think it it's, would be quite interesting or whether providing context to these treatments potentially would actually increase their effectiveness indeed. Yeah. 